doing sketches. And then when I went, uh, when I was in New York earlier for the importer, uh, it was another owner founder. And what, what he taught me at 26 years old was, and I started, I started, um, I was designing product, developing it, and then I was actually selling it. So I was like doing the, the full circle. And he said, you know, go ahead, you know, make decisions. And he empowered me. He said, there's no mistake that you can make that I can't fix. So make good decisions, you know, make sure you, you know, you, you think well and you have a reason for what you do, but, but go and, and, and just do. And to have somebody say, there's no mistake you can make that I can't fix. So just go, go and, and have at it. It's so, I mean, so much freedom, so much empowerment. Um, and, and not being, you know, managed by any kind of, fe you know, fear. I wanted to do, I wanted to do well, but that's where, you know, weighing, you know, with, with the information that I had, you know, to make decisions. And sometimes you don't have all the information you need. That's another story. But, you know, that just, that allowed me to just keep, you know, to keep growing in the position. But more importantly, it really gave me a very, very critical management tool. So, you know, as I, you know, join Skechers and started moving up from, you know, just managing kids shoes to managing, you know, product development and working with more and more people, you know, the fact that, that how you, how you, how you teach people and how you lead as a manager being where you empower and you, you know, you bring information to light. And then you talk about when a decision was made, if somebody makes a mistake, there was something that it's usually not because they don't care. It's they didn't have all the facts that maybe didn't think it through enough, but that's where education, you know, comes in as far as just working with people, you know, not managing by fear, not yelling. I have, I, I have never liked being yelled at. So it really, you know, I don't yell at people. It's not, it's not a productive tool to fixing and, and doing a go forward because it's all about the go forward, right. As a, as a manager. So um, that was, you know, that that definitely has been something that I've grown um, along the way. And then um, we talked, let's see, what was the other? Oh, yeah. So, so management, that changing. Um, the other thing that that happens is, is that as I started to manage more people and also working with, um, you know, our, our factory groups that aren't our employees, but I have to still kind of sell them on, you know, doing things for Skechers and being a partner. Um, I came up with um, something that I called the uh, CPR, and it was a real quick little acceptance speech that I gave somewhere, and it became, you know, like part of my management skill, and it was basically, you know, CPR, it's not, you know, saving somebody's life, but as a manager, it's care, protect, reward, so the first thing is you care about your people, the second thing that you do is you protect your people, you protect them from making mistakes, you know, you protect them from, you know, if, if there's environment in the workplace that's not comfortable, you protect them from that. And then the last thing you do is reward them. And that's not only financial, that can be just a thank you or a pat on the back. So, you know, CPR is part of what I've stressed to, um, you know, my management team and our factory management team about how to, um, you know, how to treat people. And it's, it's been pretty successful, actually. So um, that was that part. And then favorite, favorite aspect, um, of, of uh, you know, the, of what I do is, is the company is made up of people. The people are the company. So, you know, I've, since I've been here for 29 years, I've hired, you know, pretty much everybody in my, you know, in my areas, I've been involved in, in uh, management interviews for other managers in the company. So my, um, you know, my greatest, um, you know, contribution to Skechers is, is building the team and having this long-term retention of the people who, you know, who are the company. Now we have people whose children work here. You know, I hired the person, they got pregnant, they went out, they came back. Now, now the child, you know, the kid is working here as a sample coordinator. So I'm, I'm really proud of that. Um, and just building up, you know, these types of relationships um, throughout the years. And then um, conversely, the people being, you know, the most successful part, guess what? The hardest part, it's not that we always say it's not about the shoes, it's the people because of, you know, just all the various, you know, people issues that happen and there's no, you know, there's no playbook because people are all different and, and the issues are different. You know, COVID, um, you know, the fear factor, right? We've never had to deal with, you know, people being legitimately just paralyzed about, you know, returning to an office. 
right? We just, I mean, that, that wasn't something that, you know, prior to two years ago that we had to deal with. So now, um, you know, with, with so many people to manage that, that's been also the, you know, the most challenging part of, of what I do. Thank you so much for talking about like the emphasis on people and respect, because those are two things that I personally value. Um, and just empowerment is just a very important part in my life and how I interact with others. So thank you for sharing that with the group. Um, so moving on to a question that's specific to you and your unique role, and also in thinking about my own future after graduation. Um, I was wondering as the highest ranking female employee, which is a beyond amazing accomplishment, um, how have you seen your identity as a woman challenged by such a male dominated industry, such as footwear, what issues have you encountered? And then also on the flip side, um, what's the best thing about being a woman in the footwear industry and how do you see women transforming the face of these global companies? So, you know, obviously this is why I had to also, you know, tell the story about the Air Force Academy, because when I, you know, contemplated that, um, you know, I, I knew that there were going to be difficulties, um, you know, with being in, you know, this like would have been the second year, you know, that women were accepted. Obviously more has come out, you know, um, about abuse and, and, you know, many things that, that happened at the different military academies with women, but I wasn't oblivious to that. So, you know, thinking about that, I was kind of, I guess, you know, like kind of steeled that, you know, there were going to be some obstacles um, as, I, as I got into, um, you know, a, a much very male um, oriented business. What happened though, again, back to being really fortunate about you know, my, my mentors and the owner founders, if you're, if you're the owner of a business, you just want a job done. And I, you know, you pick the most qualified person and they were very, both, both, uh, both of them have been very, you know, oblivious to gender, race, anything. It's, it's still very performance-based, which is also, you know, empowering. So I've been, been fortunate about that. Um, as we, as we traveled though, you know, and I was representing the company, especially, you know, Korea was, you know, they, they, they thought I was a secretary, they wouldn't look me in the eye, they didn't want to have, you know, like they would look at, you know, look at the male who was with me to keep and just kind of very, you know, be very dismissive. We had some Asia partners too, who, who kept saying, well, you know, I'm going to call, you know, Robert, and I'm going to ask him, you know, for orders. And, and I'd be, you can do that. Robert's going to come back to me and, and, you know, but he didn't, he just didn't quite get it. So, you know, there's, there's always been, been a few, you know, a few people who, who maybe didn't understand or, or uh, you know, undervalued my position, but I think through, you know, through the years and respect and the, and the hard work, um, you know, they, they came to understand, not that it was, you know, as easy, you know, 30, you know, 30 years ago, it's gotten more, you know, definitely I think more level set now. Um, definitely there were pay, you know, pay discrepancies um, that happened. Those just were, you know, a fact of kind of a fact of how it was, you know, well, you know, the male's got to support a family. He needs more money than, you know, maybe a single female even for doing the same job. And that, that not, that's to totally not fair. I've also had both of my uh, mentors tell me, Kathy, things aren't always going to be fair. So just kind of, you know, get used to it, which is a little bit of a hard lesson, but, you know, at least steps are being taken and more things are happening in the workplace now to address that. Um, as far as, you know, the, the best part, you know, about being a woman is, you know, especially in the footwear industry, you know, and at Skechers, I mean, our, you know, the majority of our, our business still is, you know, we sell more, you know, more women's shoes than we do men's shoes. And women, women purchase the shoes for a lot of the men in their life. So a lot of the men's shoes are bought by women. And for sure, a lot of the kids' shoes, right, are bought by women. So I feel that it's important, um, you know, to be in a leadership position in a company where the customer is predominantly, you know, a woman that, you know, and to have a voice in, you know, even some of, you know, like, you know, some of our marketing efforts and, and how we're, you know, addressing, you know, that. Um, and then as far as, you know, in the, in the workplace, you know, the, there's, there's a reason why a lot of the HR managers are, are women, you know, more so than men. And, and I do believe that having had to, you know, go through so many, you know, so many people being out on maternity leave and people having, you know, childcare issues when they want to return to the workplace and trying to work through, you know, through these issues that were more specifically, you know, women oriented and trying to come up with solutions, you know, and flexibility to keep, 
um, you know, the really talented women in, you know, in the work, workplace and able to, you know, return to work um, that, you know, we became, we became really good problem solvers. We became more nurturing. We became, you know, think outside the box, um, you know, creative thinkers about how to, you know, how to work through some of these issues because we don't have a, you know, a, a daycare um, program here, although we have a lot of people, you know, advocating for that. So I do feel that, you know, that's been, that's been a strength. I've had a lot of people who've been able to have, you know, have me involved in their career and have honest conversations with me that I don't think they would have been able um, to necessarily have um, with a male counterpart. So, um, I, you know, I think, I, I, I think there are some definite strengths to having, you know, to having women in upper management here for sure. Yeah, thanks for shedding light on like the strength and solidarity in womanhood and the workplace. I think it's a really important topic. Um, so I guess the next question that I have is COVID related and you already spoke on this a little bit more about people being afraid to come in. Um, but I just wanted to shed light on this because I know the past couple of years have been hard for everyone. And even this fireside chat is virtual. So we're still in the pandemic <laughs> and it's still an issue. Um, but how have the last couple of years impacted aspects of your work and with those obstacles that you faced, how have you overcome them? <laughs> so definitely, well, yeah, the first one is I'm not, I am not, you know, the world's most uh, technical person. So that was the first, that was the first thing. Okay, how do we navigate, you know, through Teams and Zoom, you know, getting that under control. Um, when we, when we shut down um, in LA, we had, we still had our group of, uh, you know, a handful of, of management still coming into the building. Um, because we had better, you know, Wi-Fi connection actually here, and we still had to manage through what was happening, you know, as the factories, you know, were shutting down, we had, you know, goods that are, that are coming in, that, you know, everything shut down, so all of a sudden we realized, oh my goodness, our warehouse isn't going to hold all these shoes, you know, customers are canceling things, you know, so we had to go into dealing with, you know, a lot of, you know, those, those kind of business, you know, logistics is, you know, plus everybody, you know, starting to work from, you know, like, well, even trying to contemplate what working from home, because we didn't know how long it was going to last. So really, the whole thing is, is, you know, back to the uncertainty, um, you know, but that's where back, you know, the, uh, the have a plan B, you know, thing like I spring into action, because that, you know, from my background, it's like, okay, but, you know, oh, we're going to open in, you know, a couple of weeks, or maybe it's going to be a month. And then after a month, well, maybe it's going to, well, let's, let's have a plan if it's not right. So, so then we started, you know, really, you know, working, you know, like with our factories to how, and they, you know, they had shut down, then they start to open, the rest of the world is shutting down. So we're navigating a bunch of, you know, logistics with people, uh, you know, immediately my boss calls and says, you know what, you, Kathy, you got to make masks. You got to figure out how to, how to source, you know, I'm in charge of sourcing. So how do we, you know, let's source masks. We were looking at, um, and so we did, we actually, our designers did some really cute prints, you know, we needed for when our stores were going to open again. So, so we got, we had, we actually, that was our little bit of fun during COVID as people were doing happy empowerment prints and everything so that, that, you know, we'd have masks available. We, we uh, brought in 4 million masks. So I'm sitting here watching like Los Angeles is in California, can't get masks. Meanwhile, you know, I can. So I don't know who are they, you know, who they were, who they were working with that, you know, but again, that was our, our footwear factories and stitching factories, you know, were helping us out. So pivoting to, you know, the things that needed to happen short term, then longer term, you know, our IT department, just like what happened at Wash U, you know, we were getting everybody when we found out we were going to shut down, IT sprung into action, people were getting, you know, computer equipment, things were being ordered that could be sent to their home. So we were navigating, you know, all of all of that. And then as it, it continued, you know, getting people to, you know, because we've got a lot of long term employees, and, and already very good connectivity between the teams, they were able to, you know, to function well and to use the tools, you know, and obviously now you've got kids at home and then the homeschooling, you know, again, you know, dealing with people who had three or four children in all different grades, trying to do homeschooling, trying to do their jobs. Who do they even talk to about that? Because they don't want to be viewed as complaining or that they're not really putting in, you know, enough, you know, time on their job, you know, but that was where, you know, I had to be, you know, a resource for them and say, it's okay, you know, we're going to get through it, you know, we have enough shoes, 
you know, they're piling up. If we, if we miss a season of new development and we slow it down, you know, things are going to be good. Luckily, you know, we're a big global company. So people weren't um, quite as afraid of losing their jobs, you know, I mean, otherwise, right. The restaurant workers, retail workers, you know, people, you know, how am I going to pay my rent? So we were really fortunate that that at least, you know, wasn't, wasn't a primary concern of our employees. So we were really trying to also, you know, reassure them that they were going to be okay, you know, work on, you know, like payment and we were still, you know, paying everybody, um, you know, fully, which, you know, to this day, everybody's really grateful and really loyal for that. Um, you know, the loss became where we had new people, you know, new people who had just, you know, joined the company, you know, they didn't, they didn't get a chance to get, you know, into the culture or to navigate, you know, make friendships, um, and get that, you know, get that connection. So those are the people who, you know, now that things have kind of level set, you know, kind of didn't, you know, didn't work out. Um, you know, it's important for us to, you know, to be able to travel, you know, and work with, you know, the factories, we, we go there and we do, you know, we make trials of samples, you know, they go back the next day, they bring us a new one, you know, we've got a whole team and we're, and we're, you know, creating and making everything happen. And in, in like a, about a two week time is how we've done it in the past, you know, so now again, that just became, you know, learning, you know, what we can do remotely. And, you know, it's like in any kind of crisis, you know, when you've got, you know, whether it's a, uh, you know, a hurricane, tsunamis, um, you know, fires, you know, where the resiliency and, and, and people's, you know, the adrenaline starts flowing and you just kind of, you, you do figure it out because I think there's something in our, you know, wiring is, is people that, that we do that. And, and luckily, you know, we, we, we did a really outstanding job. I'm, I'm so proud of the creative people because they really, they thrived more than I even thought they would, you know, the, instead of shopping for research, right? Thank you, you know, to the internet for providing the tools that we needed to be able to create relevant product. Um, again, long-term partnerships, it would have been hard to bring a brand new factory, you know, into our group, but because we had existing relationships and, and people with, you know, long-term who know what our requirements are, even without us being able to be together in the same room, they really, they really pulled it together. Um, you know, and now as we emerged from, you know, we still um, got hit with the South Viet Vietnam issue, um, Nike and Adidas really got hurt. We don't have as much of a sourcing presence there, but, you know, the factory has been very touch and go even after they, they opened. You know, and this is back to, you know, here we are, you know, you look at the United States and every state's got different rules and, you know, do I wear a mask? Do I not wear a mask? Do I need a vaccination? Do I, you know, and it's a little crazy. Well, you know, in, in Vietnam, it's like there's a staff member who gets COVID and they, they quarantine the whole entire factory. You know, they shut it down. It's two weeks. The government comes in. Everybody gets tested. And, and so they, you know, they are controlling that. And, you know, it's thinking about that level of control here, you know, in the United States. I mean, you, would, you know, nothing like that would ever work. But it's a very real reality to those of us, you know, sourcing, you know, in Vietnam and China about how seriously, you know, they take even one case and will completely just, you know, shut down a whole factory or a village or, or whatever to do all the, um, you know, to do the necessary testing. So, you know, now as we, as we come out of it, um, it's still, you know, uh, here we go, Om Omicron, you know, so the fear and everything, it's really the, you know, the biggest challenge that we have. Again, it's not the shoes. Now it's dealing with vaccinated people are getting COVID. We did, we did so well prior to people being vaccinated with not having any instances and, and, and having people in, you know, a couple of, you know, a couple of days, one or two days, and then working remotely, you know, is how we kind of came back. And now we're, we're, we're more back than, than not really in, in my areas, but now the vaccinated people are getting, are getting COVID and it's not as severe, you know, for the symptoms, but now it's like a weekly occurrence that we found out somebody, you know, tested positive who's been vaccinated. So this is a new, you know, the, the vaccination didn't prevent it from, from getting it. And I, I don't know if people thought that it would, but, but the reality of us now with, you know, people is, is dealing with that. We just had a trade show in New York and, you know, there were a couple instances of people coming down with it. And then we have to do contact tracing and inform, you know, whether it's customers or, you know, our own staff. So that's a new reality that, you know, we're, that we're dealing with until, you know, one day, hopefully not, but 
So yeah, so it's been, you know, that's, I mean, the challenges are just, it's problems, it's back to the problem solving skills that, you know, we have our policies, we have what we know we need to do. And then the human element where, you know, making exceptions for people who are extremely fearful and how we, you know, we navigate, you know, through that, but it's another, it's, yeah, it's just another challenge and a learning curve that, you know, hopefully sometime 10 years from now, we'll say, oh my God, remember when we had to, you know, deal with all those, you know, all those issues, now we're living through it. You know, and, and people thought it might be over. And now, you know, everybody is talking about, well, will, will we be able to go to China, you know, in Asia next year in 2022? You know, I hope so, but we don't have a, you know, a crystal ball to know, you know, is there going to be another more serious variant that comes up or, you know, is, is something else, you know, what else can happen? So it's, you know, every day it's a, it's kind of, well, where we are and trying to get through what we need to do to keep the business running and keep people, you know, keep people safe and healthy. I'm going to interrupt here and just let you all know that there are a lot of audience questions in the <laughs> Q&A. Um, so Eliana, if you have one more question, um, then I would like to ask some questions from the audience. Yeah, for sure. So my last question um, also kind of had to do with the last couple of years. And I was just wondering, because we operate in a society where social awareness, cultural awareness, and sustainability is crucial, to the successful operation of a business, like at least in my opinion. Um, how do you see your role in Skechers enhancing that? Um, and how have you fostered or helped foster cross-cultural connections in this increasingly globalized society that we live in through Skechers? Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, in, in product development, I mean, just in dealing with our, with our different markets, because Skechers is a global brand, 60% of our, our business is international. Um, and our biggest, you know, outside of the United States um, base is China. So, um, you know, we, we do special, you know, special product for different, you know, for different markets, you know, and special makeups that address, you know, their, you know, various product needs and what's happening, um, you know, in their market, you know, as well as obviously their seasonal, you know, nuances throughout the globe. Um, we do have the greatest breadth of product of any of uh, the, the major footwear brands between men's, women's, kids, sneakers, sandals, boots. So, you know, we're, we're not targeting as much a specific group because we really are a family, you know, we target, it's really, you know, like we're a family brand um, with comfort. But as, you know, as we, you know, watch what, what happens, you know, obviously we weren't getting, you know, any cotton from, um, you know, the Xinjiang area in China, but that, you know, that became issues that we, you know, have to deal with. And, you know, I get those, those questions come to me since I have sourcing, um, you know, sustainability is, is also, you know, um, on my plate to deal with, with, um, you know, the factories I have, you know, the compliance issues, the human rights. Um, that's what I said about, you know, learning to learn. Um, very early on, I got involved in our, um, you know, our digital and e-com business and what it was going to take to grow that because I thought it was important to, um, you know, the company um, overall success and it became very important during COVID. So, you know, I was help, I was instrumental in that part. And then, you know, with the sustainability and watching, um, you know, what our competitors are doing and what even other brands that, that have just complete sustainability stories are doing um, between material suppliers and what the factories, you know, the factories are doing as far as their own emissions and everything. So I am heavily involved in that and, um, you know, working, working with the factories to come up with, you know, our plans and what are, you know, setting, setting our goals. So we're, we're working on that um, now to make sure that we're, you know, we're still aware of all those, um, you know, of all the, of all the issues and then, and then really using our relationships to, you know, but yeah, hold, you know, hold our factories accountable. And they all, they all realize these things too. So they're like sketchers, what do you, you know, just tell us, you know, what we need to do. And, and we're working on setting the goals and everything. We have some great, um, you know, women's programs and everything in our, in our factories that, um, you know, we work with our, our compliance team to come up with because we feel women's empowerment um, is important. Um, so that's, yeah. That answered, I think, I think some of that. So thank you so much. Hey, I have some questions from the audience. Our first one comes from David Simpson, who is a 1980 poli-sci grad. And first he wonders if you remember Professor Jim Davis and um, Professor Salisbury. 
Salisbury, yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, I know Jim Davis. I, yeah, I actually remember Jim Davis, but I remember, our, yeah, yes. Um, now that people throw so <laughs> he's uh he's also wondering if you could uh, talk about a person who has had a, a real impact on your profession as a leader and maybe someone who's mentored you and what impact they've had on your life. Those were two questions I got the, the well, the, men, the mentoring, the mentoring still really had to do with with my, you know, with my first boss with giving me, you know, all the opportunity and then and then having me have, you know, like, like a, a very safe place if I failed, that we were just going to move forward. Um, you know, so that was that was really from a from a mentoring, um, you know, perspective, that was really that was really critical. And I got to do, um, you know, a lot of a lot of travel where people were, you know, you're sending, you know, you're sending her and, and uh, somebody else from our Hong Kong office. I mean, we went up, you know, into um, Beijing, Shanghai, we were all through China and, and people would just stop and stare at me because they'd never seen a Western woman before, you know, in these factories. And, and you know, so kind of um, there was something about, you know, just being fearless and being able to do that. A flight got canceled. You know, well, how are we going to get back? I said, well, we're going to take a train. And somehow I didn't, I didn't speak, I didn't speak Chinese. So he did. And he was petrified that we were going to, you know, just get in with all these, you know, people you know, it wasn't a business class situation, but we were just going to get on this train for 36 hours and make it back. And, you know, we just, we just did, but that was, that was where I, you know, had somebody who, you know, that was just what you, what you do. I was bound and determined that I was going to, you know, make a success out of this. And again, just, you know, getting, getting the opportunity to do all that and trying to make um, the best, you know, the best that I could with it. Um, and the other thing is watching, yeah, I was just watching, you know, other, other management styles of people though, because I've, I've really learned, you know, learned from, you know, from, from that um, and, and been able to try to be creative and, and coming up with problem solving, um, you know, skills from just being allowed to, to try things. We tried for, I'm in charge of quality. So, and that's, that was actually very important about, you know, people resonating with Skechers. What's important, what's my job that they have a good experience with the product. They may not like the style, but once they buy the shoe, I want them to feel like this was, you know, I, I paid a good price, the shoe held up, and I had a good product experience. So that's, you know, that, that's very important to me. But um, so with the quality, how do we, how do we get the, you know, the, the management understands it, but how do we get the people who are making the shoes to understand it? Well, we started contests. So, and that was, you know, to, and, and so they, when they win, and they have the best quality of the day. They get a little, you know, they over the over the production lines. They got like special flags and banners that said, you know, they were the number one quality. And we we kind of gamified it a little bit, but it became really important to to them. So just trying to think of creative outside of the box, um, you know, solutions and a you know and, and being empowered to be able to to do that was important too. Can you speak a little bit more about the ethical concerns that you run into in your position, especially when it comes to um, sourcing from other countries? So we um, right now, our predominant sourcing is really um, China and Vietnam, a little bit um, Cambodia, Indonesia. Um, so we have long term factory partners, we do have, you know, we have our own compliance team so we're doing, you know, our audits, we have our own, um, we have about 180 quality control um, people who are in the factories um, daily monitoring the quality as well as obviously, you know, they they're there so they're, you know, making sure that, um, you know, everything is is running, you know, as it should be. Um, we have, you know, the I mean, obviously, they've all signed their, you know, agreements about, you know, human rights compliance, um, and especially, you know, as with us being, you know, a public company and a brand, I mean, that's a very, very serious, um, you know, issue, you know, with us, they, they know that if there's any kind of, you know, infraction, um, you know, we can't do business with them because we're, you know, we're a public company and we're beholden to our, our shareholders, um, you know, for that. So, uh, you know, it's an area that's got a lot, it's had a lot more light shown on it in, in recent years, you know, than, than when, you know, than when we, we started. But, you know, I know for the, you know, for our level of factory, um, 
you know, every, everything is above board and, and in compliance. And we do business with, you know, there's other Costco and other people that they also obviously have their own independent auditors that go into our factories um, and everything. So, so that's all well and good, but there are, you know, having, having traveled enough, I mean, there are, you know, there are, there is a whole other level of, of, um, you know, factories out there too, especially making for the local market where it gets, you know, where it gets a little, you know, a little, a little dicier. Um, but yeah, so well, I have a monitoring. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I have one more question. Um, and it's, it's really a conglomeration of a bunch of questions that I bet are coming from students and parents on the call. Um, a lot of questions about um, how you learned about potential career options and um, which, uh, which aspects of your education uh, really factored into your success. I heard you mention writing at one point. Mm -hmm. um, and also, uh, if, there, if you have any suggestions for students who might be interested in an internship or um, maybe a position as a new graduate at Skechers. Um, so if you could just talk about that transition from college, liberal arts degree into the world of work and um, what suggestions you might have for them. So yeah, and we, at this point, you know, especially with COVID, it made it, you know, even harder for, for things like internships. And, and those are always tricky for businesses because the person, you know, ends up, you know, we're, we're working with them and then, and then they end up leaving or they're here for such a short time that we, you know, they're, they're kind of shadowing, but they're not really learning yet because they're just seeing how something works. And by then the internship, you know, is sort of, is sort of over because especially with the, you know, with the sourcing and, and like the product cycle, you know, of a product from, you know, like design beginning to end to when you get it back and get it into a, you know, into a store is around a year, you know, so normally an internship would be, would be, you know, small, a shorter time. So those are, those are always a little bit, um, you know, a little bit trickier. So we haven't um, actually been able to, to do those. Um, you know, when people, when people start here, we have a lot of college graduates who start um, in, in a job that we call, it's a, it's a sample coordinator. So we have showrooms here, that's what you see behind me. Um, you know, and we have to keep the shoes in a certain order. We have to send shoes out to different accounts. And, um, you know, it, it, it's funny because it's like, and it's a lot of, you know, you're changing out the displays. It's got a lot of similarities with working, working in retail. But what they what what the the smarter people gather is that they see okay new shoes are coming in old shoes are going away what are the details of the shoes what's a color story of a different shoe and they start to like pick up a lot of other things about the shoes and then that became the stepping stone for people that right now are VPs in the company so and this was part of the you know and I was like the original person even starting you know it, it's like okay I had to teach you know, here's, here's how the order that the shoes are going to go in in our showroom. Here's how we're going to present them and teaching them, you know, how to talk about the shoes and all that. So it was like the entry level position. Um, and, and we have people who, who, when they interview, you know, with, you know, with a college degree, they're, oh, that's, I mean, you can tell they're, they, they don't come out and say that that job is beneath me, but you can tell that that's what they're thinking. So, so then I start talking to them about what, you know, what the foundation is of the learning because all the questions that are, they're going to ask if they're really paying attention to what they're doing they're they're going to see it they're going to understand you send shoes to an account oh okay so we've got our own retail stores we deal with third-party accounts where did the shoes come from did that shoe come from china or vietnam oh they're sourcing how does the sourcing work oh you've got you know what 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 are the price oh this shoe this shoe is going to close out why didn't it why didn't it work oh this other shoe is a bestseller and everybody wants these samples well what's making that shoe work what is it that's resonating with the consumer are we marketing it so you can like right you can like this just becomes a whole you know all these different questions that lead to the other positions in the company once they you know kind of get a foundation so the importance of of trying to get in you know, to, to a company and being willing to start on something that you might think is at a lower level, but, but as soon as you get in, you can see that the questions about the business and peeling back the layers of the onion about those things 
will resonate and then, you know, quickly do, you know, the bright people with the talent, you know, move, move beyond that and move up. But they started with a very solid foundation. So. Wonderful. So I am sorry that we've reached the end of our time for today. I thoroughly enjoyed this. Um, I, uh, I've uh, ordered a lot of Skechers shoes during the hour that we've been on this time. <laughs> I'm kidding, but I might afterwards. It is, uh, it is the season. Um, I wanna really thank you, Kathy and Eliana for taking time away from your very, very different but very, very busy um, schedules and celebrating the power of arts and sciences with us. As Dean Hu mentioned in his welcome, the new strategic plan for arts and sciences was just made public. And we'd like to end by sharing a video that celebrates our new vision for arts and sciences. Also a link to the strategic plan website is in our chat. I hope that you will each check that out. Thank you again for your time and attention. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah, I wanna thank everybody for joining out there. Thank you. Our campus sits near the confluence of two ancient rivers. Ecosystems merge and thrive in our midst. Our region has seen diverse cultures take root, fight for survival, and reach toward greatness. A host of resources, historical and cultural, innovative and intellectual, enrich our work. They draw us to engage with our city with each other and with communities around the globe. Our school, Arts and Sciences, represents a convergence of ideas, ideas that shape our understanding of the world and indeed the world itself. We will elevate scholarship that is creative and ambitious by embracing new ideas, emerging technologies, and shifting paradigms. We will honor and promote the pursuit and discovery of knowledge. We will seek distinction in cutting edge scholarship and push boundaries both within and among disciplines to meet the most critical challenges facing our communities and our planet. We will find new ways to tell our story, to share the matter and meaning behind our work. We are an institution devoted to bringing people together to serve the public good. Our partnerships here in St. Louis and across the region will identify shared goals, and we will pursue academic and educational excellence that positively impacts our communities. We will forge critical connections from the local to the global, expanding solutions, and imparting lasting impacts on the world within our own community faculty, staff, and students of all identities will feel valued, represented, and equally empowered to pursue their goals. Here, we will create meaningful connections with our peers, our mentors, and the St. Louis community. We will gather knowledge and learn how to apply it to build lives filled with meaning and purpose. We will go out into the world as engaged, active, 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 active and impactful members of our communities. Together, our voices will rise to shape the next decade and all the decades to come. We are ready. The time is now. Welcome to the Decade of Arts and Sciences.